there's going to be a changing of the guard. And uh, when, when I was honored with this position, the deal was that it was for an 18 month stand and that has come to an end and everything's back on track. I'm really excited and humbled to be the seventh executive director of MUFON. The main thing I'd really like to focus on for MUFON moving forward is really three things. The first is we really need to be more social. Uh, we need to have social media presence with uh, folks out there. We need to have easy access to our sighting reports uh, for people to be able to look at them, to determine them. Um, not just IFOs, but we really want to get it boiled down to the real UFOs. And so we have a work underway right now by our science review board to actually cull through the 800 or so reports we get a month and boil it down to the significant few so we can actually make those the center point of MUFON. Um, we really need to take away the stigma that MUFON is the, somehow the secretive organization that hides things. So we need to really do the analysis, and that's what's being done right now by our science review board to go through this and to publicize uh, the real hard cases that show that there's something extraordinary going on in our skies. Well, actually, David McDonald has done a terrific job reaching out to our neighbors in France and Italy. He's going to actually be our international ambassador to those organizations. So uh, we've just announced that Jacques Patinet is the new lead for MUFON France. Jacques came from Japan and was the last leader there. So there's a tight connection now between MUFON and Japan, uh, which is the UFO reporting agency for the European Space Agency in France. Japan is a small department, as I said, of the French Space Agency dedicated to collect information about UFO sightings to try to make analysis of these cases to classify them into four classes. The class A is surely identified, B is probably identified, C is a big class which contains all cases for which there is not enough data to do any serious jobs, so nothing can be said, it can be true, not true, whatever. And D is the unidentified phenomena, which recently have been subdivided into D1 and D2. D1 being things which are strange with a medium consistency. Consistency is the, 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 the strength of the case in terms of number of witnesses, in terms of uh, additional data such as pictures or radar traces or things like that. And the D2, the ultimate class, is the one of very strange and very consistent. We were very fortunate that Dave McDonald was able to go to France and basically collaborate with them in person and build this alliance. Governments around the world, they're actually coming to us. They're asking, will you help us put together our investigative manuals? How do you handle the media? How do you handle this? And many of them said, will you work with us because your own government won't. And yes, we are. Um, I have met with the heads of the European Space Agency, the head of the French Space Agency, Japan, Ecuadorian Air Force, Brazilian military. I mean, it's just incredible the response that we have on, on, a, global, on a global basis. And that's, to me, that's my shining moment, that's, that's my contribution, and I'm darn proud of the, the strides that we have made. We are at Just Cause Productions. This is where the work on the DVD Blu-ray sets for the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure are going to be uh, produced, as well as the documentary Truth Embargo based on the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. Let's go in and take a look at the facilities. Ron. Steve. Good to see you, man. Hey, how's it going? It's going just great. This is Ron James, who is the producer of the uh, DVD Blu-ray project on the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure. Ron's been working with us for a long time. He's the founder of Evolve TV. Um, uh, the, the, also the producer of the Disclosure Dialogues. He worked on the last two ex-conferences that were held in Washington, D.C. And so we're glad to have him, very much glad to have him involved in doing this rather exceptional, long and difficult project to create 
these quality Blu-ray and DVD sets for the public on the Citizen Hearing. Sure. So it's really nice to be able to do the follow-up work on this. We also recorded everything on site and took care of some of that live production. So now what we're doing is getting the final edits done, polishing them up in a manner that makes it so that they're television quality. It's going to be really easy to watch. We're putting a lot of effort into making sure that the edits are all smooth, the colors are balanced, the audio is perfect. And of course, some of this work is clearly going to carry over to the documentary, Truth Embargo, which is being built around the citizen hearing, which we hope to be bringing out uh, much later in 2013, early 2014. Out of all the projects that I've worked on, I've made several UFO-related documentaries. We did the Disclosure Dialogues, we did the Mysterious Valley, um, a bunch of different ones in the genre. I interviewed and worked with just about everyone. I helped you produce the first two or last two X conferences, and finally this. This is by far a shining achievement in the field, and it's a historical achievement, and it was so well done that it's just a pleasure to work on it. Um, yes, this is Dr. Joe Bookman, who is a member of the board of the Citizen Hearing Foundation, and he is going to be hel helping to advance the mission statement of that foundation, which is to, one, uh, hold another citizen hearing, right, and two, to move forward a resolution to be submitted to the General Assembly calling for a world conference uh, to examine the evidence uh, pointing toward an extraterrestrial presence. And Joe, what are your thoughts on that right now? How's it looking? Well, there are two major efforts. One that came out of the lead of uh, former Senator Mike Gravel and the other five members of the United States House was uh, the resolution calling on the Citizens Hearing Foundation to advance the cause of bringing this to the attention of the United Nations. Certainly, each of the six former members of the United States Congress saw this as an issue worthy of being examined at the highest levels of government all over the planet, not only here in the United States, and not only by former members, but by the current sitting members of the United States Congress, as well as the Congresses and representatives of other nations around the globe that are interested in seeing disclosure occur, but also primarily bringing this to the attention of the United Nations. I think one of the most important things that people will take away who eventually watch the DVD and Blu-ray box sets is that if the actual Congress, the sitting members, were to bring the same witnesses and many others which are also available to testify uh, before the House or Senate on this subject, that they would undergo the same transformation that the former members of Congress went through as they were able to really see this testimony for the first time. Uh, if that were to happen, I believe the truth embargo, which is now it's in its 65th year, would very likely be over pretty quickly. And I think it's also important that um, the the public get involved in this. It would be wonderful if we had the funds to simply put all this together and get it all out, uh, but we don't. Uh, on the other hand, I think there's some wonderful benefit from, from the public getting involved and owning this process, being part of this extraordinary historical process, which ultimately will lead to a formal acknowledgement of, of the U.S. government, of the ET presence, the fact that we're not alone, and of course that's a major change in human history.
believe we are alone in the universe. Two men say that a series of events dating back to 2012 have let them know that there is extraterrestrial life out there. WWAY's Holden Kowicki has more in the lead at 530. It's only on three. In the beginning, I was very nervous at times. Being a family man with young children, these lights are happening very close to my home. Very, very close, just several hundred feet away and oftentimes not much higher than the trees. Brendan Brodsky and Joe Kiernan are two everyday guys who claim to see lights in the Carolina sky that are out of this world. Most of the time it starts off with one orb, of one orange orb that's almost see-through, and then they'll string out almost like they birth out of each other. Just chuk, 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 chuk. And there's no sound, there's no helicopters, airplanes, nothing that could be explained. Natural skeptics, the men have taken their sightings to the authorities, and more often than not, are left searching for answers. We've called on many times the FAA to see if there's been any pilot reports or anything reported in the sky in that area at the time. Uh, we've checked with Shaw Air Force Base to see if they had any training exercises going on. And uh, usually on these very high active nights, there's, there's nothing going on at all. While many may be scared off by the experience, the men say it has opened their mind up to a whole new world of thinking. We are not alone, uh, realistically and mathematically. I don't believe it's possible. There's, there's many more out there. It just be kind of ignorant, I think, to say we're just the only life form, well, the only intelligent life form in this whole universe that's constantly expanding. In Brunswick County, Holden Kerwicki, WWAY News Channel 3. Former Apollo 14 astronaut Dr. Edgar Mitchell was on a radio show over in England, and he says that for six decades the government's been covering up the fact that aliens do exist. Guess who's joining us on the phone? Dr. Mitchell, good morning to you. Good morning. Dr. Mitchell, you've walked on the moon, you've done so much, we've had an, uh, a fantastic career. How long have you known that we've had contact with aliens? Or I've known for 60 years. Mm -hmm. But, however, uh, as a result of my astronaut experience, uh, some of the old time, what I call them the old time, who were hushed up, they wanted to pass on their story before they passed on. So, uh, I was contacted, and I was told their stories many years ago. Okay, uh, Edgar, who are the people who told you there were aliens, and uh, how would they know? I, I'm not going to give names. So, some of the people were just locals involved in the so-called Roswell crash when that happened. And also, my folks were ranchers in that area, and we knew all the ranch people at that point right. throughout their life. Because, Dr. Mitchell, that was my whole point when we discussed this earlier today, was what kind of secrecy document would you have to sign if you were given this type of privileged information? In those days, there wasn't a, uh, as, it wasn't a document. Yeah. They were threatened. I mean, there was real threat. Uh, you're not going to talk about this. Who, like, for example, when you talk to these people who wanted their stories to live on because they won't. It was just to confirm that the Roswell incident did take place okay. and it wasn't, the government knew it was an alien uh, spacecraft. Now, uh, it, was about, it was about 10 years ago, you had a press conference where you, you laid all these facts bare. You, you talked about this I in public. Actually, yes, I actually See, went to the Pentagon and was uh, talked to intelligence officer at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. And uh, he said, I don't know about this, but I'm going to find out. All right. And he eventually called me back and said, you're right. But he couldn't get in and get well, access to it. What's that guy's name? No, I'm not going to tell you that. Well, I mean, because look, uh, Edgar, a lot of people are listening to this and they're thinking, well, I maybe... don't care what they think. You want my story? I'm telling you. No, I mean, we, we understand, but some people think okay, that so, it's so let me ask you this, credible. Dr. Mitchell. Do you think that other people now will come to the forefront since this is being discussed again, since you're I bringing this? I think it's about to because there's been a lot of very serious and good investigators working this problem for 50 years or more. I mean, you realize this is a story of the century. If it's true. Well, the fact that we have not alone in the universe, that's a very important it, story. I mean, that's better than yeah. a, a little bit of water on Mars. Of course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And let me tell you, it beats water on Mars. And the fact that these little, creatures, these little creatures are nice and smarter than us <laughs> or is it bigger news. Dr. Uh, Edgar Mitchell, we thank you very much for joining us on the phone to try to straighten things out. And we thank you for uh, getting up early this morning okay. down there in Florida. You know, this is the area where the flying saucer crashed and scattered debris for at least a mile in 
in circumference around here. And uh, my dad was the one that Colonel Blanchard sent out here to investigate what the source of this crash was, whether it was a military plane or a civilian plane or whatever. But uh, when he and uh, Sheridan Cabot, the CIC agent, got out here to investigate, they determined this was not a crash of a known type of aircraft. So they picked up representative Porsche pieces of it and uh, later sent out a crew to vacuum up what was left uh, and, and they brought it back into Roswell. Now my dad uh, stopped off at our house so I could see what he saw too and, and it was indeed strange material. There's uh, some beams that, uh, uh, of, look, of metal that had some strange writing or, or symbols along the inside surface of it. And that's what really caught my attention because I thought at first this was like a Egyptian hieroglyphics, but you look at it, no, it's not. It's uh, more like uh, geometric symbols, mathematical symbols written along the inside surface of this eye beam that was only about three eighths of an inch in, in diameter, 12 to 18 inches long. And uh, that kind of set it apart as from normal stuff for me anyway. These fragments uh, will have come from uh, from various locations centered in and around where we're where we're standing out here, and uh, I'm hoping that the testing that has been done on this material and will be done will conclusively prove that we uh, that that a extraterrestrial craft went down out here. Exactly. And we do have a little bit of proof on it. Uh, we need more testing just to actually prove it and uh, to have. Jesse Marcel Jr. out here uh, with us looking at this and, and uh, you know, he, he even mentioned that, I think you said that the, uh, the material sort of kind of looks like what you saw. It does, yeah. So There's a strong resemblance it's, there. Um, it, it's kind of exciting and I've gotten that same information from uh, uh, other people, another person that saw the material out here too. So yeah. it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of exciting. It's it like is. historical. Well, stuff, you know, so. my, my dad said they did vacuum the place up, meaning they were very, very careful to pick up all visible remnants, but that doesn't mean that the small pieces weren't there too, because they easily missed. And that's what I came out to look for, was that's what, tiny stuff. Because there's got to be some small fragments still out there. Well, you know, just like we've got today, we've got this this rainstorm, thunderstorm coming in, and, and uh, Mac Brazel didn't uh, didn't make the discovery till a couple of days later when he was coming out to check on the sheep. Yeah. We're out here to check the fence lines, and that left plenty of time for stuff to wash and blow away. Oh that, yeah. That our government would have never never they would have never found. Never found it. Yeah. History in the sky. Look at this. Viewers and even a K2 photographer captured the strange lights on camera last night. Today, many people still wondering what they could be. K2's Erica Knocklin got to the bottom of it. Erica, so many people were looking to the sky last night for fireworks, so this really got a lot of attention. And those fireworks were why a K2 photographer was up here on the roof, ready to roll on his camera when he saw those other lights and decided to record those as well. He wasn't really going to say anything about possible UFOs until viewers started emailing in too, wondering what they were. We caught some video. See that little light right there? Where, where, All right. Where? What? Any guesses? Aliens. Had to be aliens. What are those fireflies? What do you think that could be? UFO. Everyone I, seems I, to have an opinion yeah, about those unidentified bright lights in the sky. Hundreds shared and commented on the video I posted to Facebook. Deb joked it was clearly Iron Man. Well, Neva guessed it's a drone. Vicky and her granddaughter saw it and thought satellite more than ET. If you look at the images, but the director of space science education at OMSI says not so fast. These lights were too slow to be a satellite or international space station, like you can see in this YouTube video. See, now you can see how fast it's moving. Okay, that's the difference from what we were seeing in that video. So what about a plane or helicopter? Jim Todd says probably not. One, did it have, did you hear any sound with it? In this case, it didn't. Not the tree, not the tree! There's a big debate on Facebook about whether the lights could be paper sky lanterns, like you see here from the ground. Robin seemed sure of it, saying there were quite a few let go in her neighborhood, and one viewer sent me these pictures from a 4th of July party when people were letting them go. But Eric argues lanterns don't shine that brightly. Also, it was strange to see the other three lights that flew underneath it. But sorry, Eric, the expert says Robin's right. And the wind, I'm sure, had a lot of factor in putting these out uh, in, their, in all different directions. So even though they don't look the same? Someone may be further back. One may be dying out with the plane. No, it's pretty common. Well, that OMSI expert says he's pretty confident those lights were just 
paper sky lanterns. Even he still calls them UFOs, unidentified flying objects, because we can't be 100% sure. Live in Northeast Portland, Erica Nachlin, K2 News. Sure had a lot of us freaked out in the newsroom last night, didn't <laughs> yeah, it? We're going to be watching this weekend. <laughs> we Looking for more of them. Erica, are. thanks for answering our question. They're easy prey for heterotrophs. These sheep behind me, these are heterotrophs, but they're feeding off autotrophs. They're feeding off the grass in this field. Charles believes that the food chain is just as real of a force for alien life as it is for terrestrials. The smarter the creature, the more food it must consume to keep its brain working. Great, thanks. Just what I ordered. You can see the hors d'oeuvre I have here, and you can get some idea of the amount of grass I would have to eat a day to power a sheep's brain. But it's a completely different matter when you need to power a human brain. If we spent all of our waking hours eating the pounds of grass it takes just to power our brain, we would have little time for the imagination and ambition that sent us to the moon. But nature provides a solution. It's not pretty, but it is a fact of life. Lamb, thank you. Our massive brains require colossal amounts of energy, and being a predator is the cleanest, quickest, and most effective way to acquire the energy necessary for advanced intelligence, whether human or alien. Intelligent creatures, particularly very intelligent creatures, would be predatory. They would be at the end of a food chain, and they would eat other creatures that would eat other creatures, so they're bound to be predatory in some way. Charles is confident that at first contact, we will meet an intelligent race of predators. Predators that most likely developed a warlike culture just like ours. Conflict in human beings is definitely linked to predation. It's all about grasping territory. It's all about having resources and commanding those resources in times of famine or in times of difficulty. Predatory aliens who show up on our doorstep may well be in need of new resources. If so, the existence of humanity could be in jeopardy.
Okay, here I am with the owner of this property, the land here where the crop circle appeared on a Sunday morning. So, signora, ci racconta come è andata l'avvenimento? L'avvenimento domenica mattina alle sette e mezza mi ha telefonato la signora che abita nella collina di fronte, che sa che il grano è nostro, e mi dice, vieni a vedere, ci sono dei disegni nel tuo grano. E io non capivo, dicevo, quale grano? Perché ne abbiamo anche altri pezzi. Okay, so what, what happens is that the woman, she wakes up on Sunday morning and the lady who actually lives across the field down there called her and said you know look go go and look at what happened in your field all the wheat is laying down but there's a design hey boy hey boy you sono andata a vedere e sono rimasta senza parole era perché era così perfetto il cerchio due cerchi perché subito ho visto i due cerchi quello mi ha colpito ho fatto col compasso Wow, so she ran to the, the, the neighbor's house down the road, could look up on her, on her wheat field and see this perfect design. She said she never believed in anything like the crop circles, very rational thinkers, very, you know, connected to the earth, but she couldn't imagine this something. She saw when she looked out on the balcony of her neighbor and saw the design, her heart just opened. She was filled with that amazement of really how beautiful this design was and how maybe doubting is not all always the key to a happy life. E poi come lo vive adesso? Poi, poi ho notato, poi ho notato il particolare, triangolo in mezzo, adesso non si vede più, due piramidi che si toccavano con la punta e ogni triangolo a seconda come il sole avevano dei riflessi che cambiava colore. No, she said that actually at the very beginning before a lot of tourists were coming and even depending on how the sunlight and the shadow played there was just different designs. There's the eight triangles, but the shadows would actually make that the grain was a whole different color. Very beautiful. Very beautiful. E lunedì che è venuto l'ufologa mi ha fatto vedere la foto aerea e lì sono rimasta ancora di più sorpresa della precisione. E quindi non sono più tanto scettica, ma non dico che credo pienamente, però secondo me non è possibile. In poche ore, perché eh, c'è gente qui vicino, all'una e mezza era in piedi e non ha visto niente, alle cinque qualcuno l'ha visto già, uno che cerca tartuffe, non so. No, sì. really? So she said that uh, on Monday morning, then a, uh, the UFO experts, ufologos, uh, came and showed her then the airplane pictures of her field. And there, once again, the rational mind leaves, her heart just opens and says, you know, maybe I don't completely believe, but there is something out there that really has blessed our lives and given us this opportunity to believe in something maybe greater than ourselves. Fantastico. Allora adesso cosa succederà? Adesso è bello trovare tanta gente, incontrare tanta gente, ma è stato un... in fondo è stato un evento yeah. piacevole. Ma ha scombussolato un po' tutto anche il paese. <laughs> Però bello, bello. Yeah. Something like this just bello. really turns your life upside down, nice. but you said all the pilgrims, pilgrims, if you're the curious people that are coming to visit, have made it just such a worthwhile adventure in their life. They will have to cut down the crops. Unfortunately, there's authorities that come in and uh, sort of take over the scene. So we really hope uh, there's abundance in their life, uh, even though a lot of the crop will be wasted. Okay, grazie mille. Grazie a lei. Grazie. If you have enjoyed this episode of Max UFO News, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe for future updates. Bye for now, and thanks for watching.